Welcome, this is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. <clears throat> Merry Christmas. We're going to be talking about the book of Daniel. And I had quite a few requests for a more in-depth discussion of what we see in the book of Daniel and why I wrote this article, which has uh, done very well in the last few uh, weeks since I posted it a couple weeks and it's so misunderstood by so many evangelicals that the real force and power of the book of Daniel is essentially removed by the errors promoted by especially modern evangelicals. And this is such a crucial book, and of course it's read in the Orthodox liturgy in regard to Christmas because that's precisely what it's about, I believe, on Christmas Eve it's read. So, Daniel is unique because it's a kind of presentation of a biblical philosophy of history. And as I say in my article, I talk about how one's philosophy of history is determined by their worldview. In other words, we may not think about the importance of history. We may think that it's irrelevant, it's unknowable. Uh, we may think that history is the tale of class warfare if we're a Marxist we may think that history is the battle of idolatry versus monotheism if we're uh, uh, Islamic or something like that so you know one's view and philosophy of history is going to be determined by what their overall worldview is and even if they don't think about having a philosophy of history they still we all still have one, whether we know it or not. And in fact, uh, you know, this is an argument I've made, a point I've made before about philosophy in general, that whether we are philosophers or interested in the study of philosophy, we still have a philosophy, like it or not. Even if we're agnostic, right? Ag uh, agnosis, right? To not know is still a kind of philosophy. So, one of the things that's unique about the biblical worldview is that it presents a different perspective of history itself um, than most world religions. Uh, now, if those world religions are monotheistic, then they can in, in ways be similar to Christianity. Uh, but even monotheistic religions at times can hold to bizarre ideas like the eternality of matter. Uh, there are some Jewish philosophers, for example, that have uh, posited the idea of eternal matter, probably under the influence of uh, Aristotle or the Greeks. So, in other words, monotheism itself is not necessarily a guarantee of creation ex nihilo, or the philosophy that God created out of nothing. Now, certainly, Christian theology unanimously uh, except for maybe a f very scant few uh, fringe theologians, has, has always held to creation ex nihilo. So it's you know pretty well known. It's not that debatable that Christianity has historically held uh, to creation ex nihilo. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why we can't accept any kind of Masonic or... Um, pagan, we might say, conception of history, because all of the Masonic and pagan conceptions of history are diametrically opposed to creation ex nihilo. And that is, again, one of the, the key unique doctrines of Christianity. I don't usually recommend William Lane Craig because uh, I think there's a lot of problems in William Lane Craig's philosophy and theology overall. But every now and then he, he does have a good book and a good argument. And his uh, book on creation ex nihilo is pretty good. I think he unquestionably proves that in the first half of the book, three-fourths of the book at least, there's no debating the fact that the biblical presentation does mean out of nothing. So the book is useful and to be commended if anything just for that that is not a recommendation of the rest of William Lane Craig's uh, 
philosophy, theology, and apologetics. It's just that uh, every every now and then he can get things right and he, he'll make a good argument. And he's he's academic and scholarly. So um, his creation ex nihilo book is pretty good. And you know this is one of the key points that he makes as well. Other apologists have made this. Many of the church fathers, when they were arguing and debating with the Greek philosophers and the pagans and, and Hellenism, you know, Athanasius does this, Basil does this, St. John of Damascus does this. When they're encountering these these pagan views, they, you know, stress these kinds of things to set Christianity off as unique. And so that, for example, is one aspect that makes our philosophy not part of the perennial philosophy. Now, there's a lot of interesting implications for this when we accept creation out of nothing. It's a revealed doctrine. So as I pointed out in the talk with Kim Tell uh, Tim Kelly, which I recommend you should listen to that if you haven't heard it, uh, what we get is a... we our doctrine of what happened at the beginning cannot be determined uh, from some sort of reasoning back process. There's no empirical study that we can do of the natural world that will lead us back to knowing what went down, you know, to bring everything into being. We just don't know from empirical observation. So how do we know? Well, in our view, right, it's a philosophical a presuppositional religious theological commitment to the doctrine of creation because it's revealed. So just as all the other doctrines that we believe are revealed uh, on the basis of divine authority, uh, as St. Hilary says, uh, they come to us from God's revelation. And so they are absolutely certain and absolutely authoritative. They're not dubious and doubtful. In fact, they're more certain uh, because in our worldview, that is our primary source of authority right divine revelation and of course the church is, a, is an aspect of that the orthodox church i'm not trying to pit revelation over against the church but what i'm saying is that in our view the <clears throat> our philosophy of history begins with the idea that history is not random it's not a chaotic explosion of uh, big bang molecules and atoms it's not anything coincidental uh, it was in fact designed and of course again we see the logos uh, present at creation in the beginning with you know the the way john in john one describes in the beginning was the word the word was with god and was god i would recommend also reading my essay on the logos which uh, a lot of people have benefited from too uh, in in tandem, I would read this in tandem with the Daniel article because the creation being done by Jesus, by the Son of God, is also central to our worldview. And thus it is Trinitarian from the outset. Right? The beginning of creation is Trinitarian. And so because we accept it on the basis of divine authority... We don't rest our case on the fads of uh, secular thought. As I made as I made clear this week in the audio talks that I did about perennialism and higher criticism, those fads come and go. And so if you read uh, Athanasius Ad Gentes against the heathens, against the nations, he talks about the prevalent secular philosophies of his day if you read the book of wisdom the author of wisdom in chapters one and two speaks of the secular quote wisdom of their day and you'll notice that in the midst of everything flip-flopping and changing and fads coming and going everything stays the same what do i mean by that what i mean is that uh, unbelieving philosophy and thought might appear to have all of these different answers and solutions but it comes and goes and so really the only constant in unbelieving thought is change as we saw with the higher critics 
the fad of uh, the documentary hypothesis and JEPD is no longer the fad of our day. So the, the, the fads that Julius Wellhausen made popular 100 years ago are not the fads, are not, are not popular in 2017. And really what you, if you, especially if you've been in the academic realm, is that you see that a lot of this depends on people just trying to make a name for themselves and come up with a creative new theory. And then, you know, money is put into their department. Money goes into their books, Bart Ehrman, whoever. And so this is why you see all these different fads that pop up in terms of quote New Testament scholarship in the realms of academia. It's just it's just as fad driven as anything else. And so that's why for us, our perspective is completely different. We don't approach the New Testament, the Septuagint, the text that we've received in our tradition from the vantage point of modern post-enlightenment, uh, post-higher critical, post-Protestant uh, rational analysis. Does that mean that we don't do apologetics? Well, so, some people <laughs> erroneously think this, and they're incorrect. And they think that, oh, that, that faith somehow means fideism. Faith does not mean fideism. Uh, if it did, you wouldn't have the 38 volumes of the church father set that I have arguing with heretics and atheists and unbelievers. You wouldn't have so many great learned churchmen who studied philosophy, St. Photius, St. Basil, classical education, etc., etc. So, no, it has nothing to do with uh, being uh, anti intellectual or uh, saying that our, our position is indefensible and you just got to take some, uh, you know, evangelical leap of faith or something. You know, you should read a chick track and pray and hope that you get the burning in your bosom like the Mormons say. No, we don't believe any of that. We believe that, obviously, there are no strictly human means that can change people's minds or convert them or whatever. It requires God's uh, illumination and God's grace to accompany those human actions. But precisely because we believe in synergism, that we do cooperate with God, uh, you know, as Paul says, he can call himself a co-worker with God. So we believe the same thing. And thus, our theology, what I'm trying to say, has to inform our apologetics. And a lot of people miss this. They don't understand that. And they will, for example, try to erect a kind of apologetic philosophy or approach. People do this all the time. That is somehow divorced from the rest of their theology and the way that they view anthropology and you can't do that so philosophy of history then as we said is uh, unique in our view because it's not any of the secular approaches it's not eternal matter it's not uh, if you were to look at modern philosophies of history you would have things like Howard Zinn and the people's history uh, our view of history is not a Marxist class warfare story and conspiracy. Our view of history is not a conspiracy theory view of history. You might think, well, Jay, you talk about conspiracies at times. You wrote a conspiracy book. Don't you also therefore believe that all of history is a conspiracy? No, this is a, an alternative media approach that we reject, obviously. We don't believe the Bible is a gigantic uh, Jewish conspiracy like the neo-pagans say. We don't believe that what's one of these uh, really idiotic ones that uh, the Vatican created Islam conspiracy. Uh, that one's a really funny one. That's one of the most preposterous <laughs> theories out there. Uh, we don't believe in a Gnostic idea that uh, every established religion is a trap or some sort of 
creation of the Demiurge and Archons, right? So these are all, uh, we don't believe in the conspiracy theory of Jesus never existed and the Roman Flavian dynasty, in, uh, you know, invented some new, new kind of character to be their front shell creation. <laughs> we don't believe any of those things. And precisely the book of Daniel is one of the great responses to all of these errors about uh, not just the alternative media conspiracy theory errors of history uh, where everything is read in one simple boil down of uh, oh, all of history is uh, the elites and the Illuminati, uh, the Babylonian priest class all throughout history oppressing the masses. You know, really, that's just a version of Marxism. Uh, you know, that's not the totality of history of history at all. And so, in you know, in the face of that kind of silly stuff, you know, I I will defend and I, I take the biblical philosophy of history. So, a great place to start is with the Book of Daniel, because Daniel, uh, amazingly, unlike any of the other Old Testament uh, books except for maybe Isaiah, you know, sometimes Isaiah is characterized as the fifth gospel because it describes so many messianic prophecies. Daniel, of course, is much shorter than Isaiah, but Daniel is the only prophet to uh, pinpoint the, pr the precise time in which the Messiah would come. Now, this is an important uh, argument that really has hit home with me in the last couple years, reflecting on these things, uh, rereading a whole lot of um, books that I read a long time ago and, and sort of just revisiting stuff. And one of the things that really hit home to me is that, you know, if you think about the fact that liberal scholarship, which I'm not giving them credence, I'm just saying, you know, to, to listeners out there, if you stop and think about it, the latest dating for Daniel is uh, like the second century BC. So in other words, the people who don't believe Daniel, uh, and I think I mentioned this in my, my essay, the people who don't believe Daniel still don't date it into post, uh, you know, New Testament period, post Christ period. It's still dated 150, 200 years prior to the coming of Christ. Now this is kind of mind-boggling because the the even the higher critical attempts I'm saying and 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 motives behind trying to destroy a lot of these these Old Testament texts and their veracity it's it still remains as a uh, you know 200 year prior to Christ prediction. So I it's kind of baffling to me that that uh, I guess people just haven't noticed this. I don't know, but it seems to me that if if you were intending on completely destroying this text, you and people's trust in it, you would need to date it after the coming of Jesus. Now, why do I say all that? Well, because many of the people who reject Christ, they reject Christ because they will make this long time higher critical argument that Jesus was a failed. Uh, apocalyptic preacher who predicted his imminent first century return. And this is important because this is going to relate to what we talk about in the book of Daniel. Uh, and the Orthodox Study Bible gets it 100% right. They understand the partial preterist arguments. Uh, and what we mean by that is that praetor, uh, praetor in the Greek refers to fulfilled. In other words, many of the prophecies, not all, many, uh, are fulfilled at specific points in time. Uh, yes, they may have a mirrored future fulfillment, certainly. There's, there's, I'm not denying that at all. But that it is rather crucial to understand the historical fulfillment precisely because that's what guarantees, in many cases, uh, a lot of veracity or, or a great degree of, of testament to the veracity right so in other words you know jesus talks often for example in the gospels about things being fulfilled this is fulfilled in your hearing right when he first enters the synagogue to begin his ministry and he reads from the prophet isaiah 
And he says, this uh, prophecy is fulfilled this day in your hearing. And of course, everybody freaks out and they're like, well, are you saying you're the Messiah? And, you know, Jesus kind of like walks out. So <clears throat> what I'm saying is that many times you'll find these predictions mentioned in the Gospels. Uh, and, you know, Paul will do the same thing in his epistles. He'll mention Old Testament texts and point out how and in what way they're fulfilled. So in the same way, when Jesus, for example, this is very crucial in Luke 21, uh, and you have, I think it's helpful to read Luke 17 and Luke 21 together. And then when you really meditate on Luke 17, and Luke 21, then go and read Matthew 24. Because you'll realize that structure uh, of what's called the Olivet Discourse or the prediction of these apocalyptic events in these famous chapters is precisely the error of so many evangelicals uh, to where they confine every bit of it to the 2,000 year later completely irrelevant to Jesus' immediate audience predictions of John Hagee and Hal Lindsey, you know, tribulation, antichrist, destruction of Israel stuff. You know, Gog, Magog, Russia's Gog and Magog, all this nonsense. That's None of that's true. Left behind stuff. Why is none of that true? Well, because all you have to do is read Luke 21. And what does Jesus say in Luke 21? He makes it very clear that the immediate context is what you have to understand. This is kind of the basic rule of hermeneutics is you understand the immediate audience. Who's the immediate audience that Jesus is talking to? It's not people in, uh, you know, Palestine in the year 2003 when Left Behind came out. It's people in Jesus's immediate presence is who he's talking to, <laughs> right? And so who he's talking to is who he is referring to when he says, you, there are some of you standing here, you know, who will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God coming in power. Right now, he had said that earlier in the gospel. And then he repeats these predictions. He says that you will see you, this immediate context, not talking about John Hagee's church, not talking about how Lindsay's TBN program, you his immediate audience there will see the temple torn down completely and the whole temple mount raised. So this is a very important prediction, right? Of the fulfillments of the prophecies, right? That have for so long been given throughout the old Testament of these crucial quote, in times, appearances and events that would occur in the Messianic era. For example, the divorce of Israel. This is described in, Isa in Hosea, excuse me, <clears throat> in Hosea. Throughout the minor prophets, Malachi 1, Hosea, right? So many of these minor prophets, there's all of these strange, mysterious statements, as we said in my New Testament talk all throughout Isaiah, all throughout the Psalms, that the that the entire nations are going to convert and worship the God of Israel. How is this possible? Well, it's certainly possible, the Jews thought, when the Messiah came and that he would kind of fix all this in some way, right? In some political way. So when the Messiah comes, he's not initially uh, a political conqueror. And so this is uh, what mystifies everyone, right? Especially, again, we're not too long after the period of the Maccabees. <clears throat> now, keep that in mind. Maccabees is going to be very important for understanding and solving these mysteries. If you read the things that I'm telling you, <clears throat> these are these are things I've studied for 20 years. And I'm, I'm telling you that, that uh, you can solve a lot of mysteries and I can save you a lot of strife and nonsense uh, if you listen to the things that I'm going to tell you to read. And one of the advantages of the Orthodox Study Bible is that you have all three of the books of the Maccabees. 
And it wasn't really until I started looking at these issues again, Daniel, the Apocalypse, uh, Partial Preterism, and the Maccabees, the, the, the great notes in the Orthodox Study Bible, that it finally dawned on me how important Maccabees is. I, I completely, totally get now why Maccabees is in the canon. Now, I, I didn't have a problem you know with Maccabees being in the canon but I always thought well you know this is an interesting story it's it's neat to see uh, you know the courage and bravery and you know this kind of you know virtues that we would still tout certainly the you know the uh, courageous aspects of the Maccabees are things that we we should uh, inculcate but you know what exactly is so important about Maccabees well, what's so important about Maccabees is the abomination of desolation. It is explicitly described in Maccabees. It's explicitly described in Daniel. And guess what? It's not just one single event, event with Antiochus Epiphanes uh, in 1 Maccabees 1, 1 and 2. Or, excuse me, 1 Maccabees chapters 1 and 2. So Daniel describes an abomination of desolation. Maccabees describes an abomination of desolation. And then Jesus, when he comes along, especially you have to read Luke, read Luke 17 and then Luke 21, and then go read Matthew 24, and then also, of course, uh, Mark's version 2 uh, of the discourse. I think Mark 13 or 12 or 13, if I recall. Now, and then when you, so all of that in tandem and you realize Jesus is talking about the same pattern that happens as described in Maccabees. Well, what's abomination desolation? Well, in the Maccabean period, which is the inter, what's called the intertestamental period, right? This is after the last Old Testament prophet, uh, Malachi, uh, records his discourse uh, you have this period, uh, what's called the intertestamental period, and for Protestants, nothing happens. There's no <laughs> revelation, no no important stories, nothing matters, and hence their canon does not include Maccabees. Uh, for Orthodox and to a degree for Roman Catholics, well, Ma Roman Catholics have Maccabees, but I don't think they really know what Maccabees, Maccabees why it matters. Uh, it is in the traditional you know, Eastern, pre-Reformation canon, East and West. So what's described there is, is the, the family of Judas Maccabeus, who is upset with Hellenization. The Maccabees are ups, uh, upset with the, the, the destruction uh, of their lineage and their tradition through Greek paganism. This is very important. Now, a lot of people would say, well, the reason... Is that now, some people don't like Maccabees because, oh, this is too Jewish. I can't... I, we can't stand this. This is... Why would... Why, some have even asked, why is Maccabees in the canon? Why is Esther in the canon? Well, I'll tell you why. What does Esther and what does Maccabees both describe? It describes the attempted destruction of the Jews. Does that? Oh, you're you're uh, you're a Zionist. You're a Zionist. Now listen. Why is it that the dictators described from the time of uh, Egypt, uh, 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 Pharaoh, to uh, Haman in Esther, and then up to the time of the Maccabees with uh, both? Antiochus and uh, Ptolemy in 3rd Maccabees and then into the New Testament with Herod what do every one of these uh, dictators do they try to stamp out the Jews now do they try to stamp them out because Jews are magically delicious no uh, 
it's not because they have some great special DNA that makes them God people. Right? I mean, this is what what does God say, you know, to Moses? I didn't choose you because you were the greatest people or whatever he says, but you because you were the least. That his power might be made manifest through the decision to use the nation of Israel as his people for that dispensation. I don't mean dispensationalism. I just mean that time period. Um, the reason these dictators sought to destroy the nation of Israel was to stamp out the messianic promise. Ever since the promise of the seed to the, in, in what's called the Proto-Evangelium or the promise, the first promise of the gospel to, to Eve that the seed her seed would crush the head of the serpent. The serpent has inspired dictators all the way back to Babel with Nimrod, you know, up to Pharaoh, to all the way up to Herod. They have sought to stamp out this group because it was who would give salvation to the nations. This is why Jesus says to the woman at the well in John 4, who's a Samaritan, who's a schismatic, Jesus says, you don't know who, what you're talking about theologically. Salvation is of the Jews. So all these, and this happens in Roman Catholicism. I get these trad Catholics who message me. I get these so-called Arians who message me. I get the, all these, all these people just constantly that you're not anti-Jew. You're not all this stuff. Listen, just listen to what I'm trying to explain to you. <laughs> stop, stop getting mad and, and just, uh, you know, reacting on the basis of emotions. What I'm trying to explain to you is that the attempt to destroy in the biblical cases I'm talking about here was to stamp out the messianic line. It wasn't because uh, every Jew has some like magical DNA that makes them greater than everyone else like the Talmud says or something no I mean that's what the prophets preach against right <laughs> uh, so it's it's because it is the spirit of evil that is seeking to stamp out the fulfillment of the coming of the Messiah whose blessing would come upon all nations this is the promise to Abraham right Genesis 12 Genesis 15 Genesis 17 Genesis 22 Consistent promises to Abraham, restatements of uh, all the families of the earth will be blessed through your descendant. Your descendants will be like the sand of the sea, the stars of heaven. He's talking about the nations worshiping through the descendant of Abraham, who is, of course, Jesus. So, all of that to say that once you grasp that that is the re redemptive history <laughs> to use the uh, German term Heilsgeschichte that's the the story of history redemptive history is the fulfillment of these covenant promises then then now you see why the dictators motivated through the spirit of evil have sought to stamp out Jews and you have, as we see in the stories of the Maccabees precisely because it is from this people that the Messiah would come. That's why Herod does exactly what Pharaoh did, right? Remember in the New, in the New Testament, Herod hears that there is a Messiah and he says, kill all the, the infants. And then you have the fulfillment of the prophecy from uh, Jeremiah that Rachel weeps for her children, right? And the, we actually honor those children in the Orthodox liturgy that were killed by Herod. But Herod is motivated to try to stamp out uh, Jewish males at that time in the same way that Pharaoh was because it was about destroying the Messiah. So, now that we come to the New Testament and we look at these famous prophetic texts from Jesus 
in particular we're talking about the Olivet Discourse and a couple statements prior to that like Luke 17 we start to realize that these are not completely and totally end-end times statements in other words what we start to realize is that for example in Acts when Peter at Pentecost quotes Joel the prophecy of Joel about Pentecost is the last days and the spirit being poured out right Peter says that those last days are now in his time at Pentecost so I remember when I was back when I was an evangelical you know 19 or something I remember reading Joel and I thought well the prophet Joel is talking about the end times because it says in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all mankind right so in other words here again a prophecy of the inclusion of Gentiles into this covenant and I remember thinking well wait a minute he says in in the last days well my false evangelical presupposition when I was 19 was that in days means you know 2000 one or 2000 right the year 2000 or whatever I was when I was whenever I was 18 I don't remember what year that was somewhere around there 1999 or something I don't know but that's not what Joel means right so you that's a case of you know I was naive and new to reading the Bible and I didn't understand a lot of these things like hermeneutics and you know how you properly interpret text and look at the historical context in the audience so Joel is talking about something that Peter says, right, is fulfilled at Pentecost in Acts 2. That is the fulfillment of what Joel's talking about. Uh, now, I'm not saying that there has that has no relevance to today. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that John Hagee and Hal Lindsey and Tim LaHaye and Left Behind and all that nonsense is 100% wrong and not only they're wrong they're completely destructive to some of the great evidences of christianity right i'm not saying right as a transcendental argument proponent we it's not that we don't believe in evidences we believe in all kinds of evidences it's just that we don't uh, pick out one evidence and try to set that up as like a final court of appeal anyway that's a different topic we're discussing uh, prophetic literature so so this idea of personal preterism is very, very obvious and very clear once you see it and once you understand, again, Jesus says, for example, in Luke 21, he talks about you will see Jerusalem surrounded by the Gentiles and it will be trampled by the Gentiles, destroyed, right, until the times the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so, in other words, Jesus is predicting, he's saying that there's a period coming when the kingdom will be removed, it will be taken away from Jews, Israel. The temple will be destroyed. He clearly says every brick will be torn down. And he says that people standing in front of him, when he says that, will see it, some of them. And then he goes on to describe fleeing to the mountains. And you better hope it's not on a Sabbath day when you're fleeing. Now, what relevance does that have to anybody now? Am I are we supposed to flee to the Ozarks? I mean, what? What is just complete bat crap crazy? Not to realize that Jesus is talking about something that the people, his apostles and disciples before him, will experience in their lifetime. And they're going to experience it during a period even where they will still be, uh, you know, keeping the Sabbath. So what I'm saying is that many of the things that he talks about, false prophets, wars, guess what? A lot of that stuff is described in the book of Acts. Paul will say that that gospel will be preached throughout the Roman Empire, the known world of that time. And... In other words, what I'm saying is that through, <clears throat> so, so post-resurrection of Christ, through that period of what's sometimes called the, uh, the transition period, where we're moving out of, uh, I mean, in other words, if you, if you read the book of Acts, you realize that there were still Christians meeting in synagogues, right? And so there were Jews who had 
believed in Christ as a Messiah. Gentiles are being converted. If you remember in the book of Acts, right, Peter is confused about this and he has to see the, the vision of the sheet <laughs> that finally convinces him. And then, of course, him and Paul have disagreements and Paul rebukes Peter uh, over this issue uh, about the inclusion of Gentiles into the covenant and that this is the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies. So point being that that transition period throughout the book of Acts is the period where the church is being led to not only foresee the destruction in 70 AD, as we read in the Gospels, but also to understand what the significance of that event is. And this is why the book of Hebrews is important, because it will it will describe the end of that entire economy, the economia, right? the mosaic economy. Uh, again, that does not mean that everything that Moses said is false. It doesn't mean that we throw out the Old Testament. We're not Marcionites. That's heresy. What it means is that the liturgical administration of how the worship is conducted will undergo a change. And the elements that the book of Hebrews describes as fulfilled will be done away. And in the mystery of God's divine providence, one of those things that is done away is the removal of the temple, which is in part a punishment, right? The days of vengeance described in the prophets, in which all things described in the prophets, actually, as the gospel say, will be fulfilled. So, in other words, the predictions of the divorce of Israel and Hosea, this is what is described in the apocalypse. And the apocalypse makes it clear multiple times that the city that's being described is spiritually Sodom and Egypt where the prophets had all been killed. What does Jesus say in Matthew, I think, 23? Uh, Upon you, this generation, will come all the blood of all the prophets from Abel to Zechariah, from A to Z. All of that judgment will come upon that generation. And it did in 70 AD. <laughs> and so if you read uh, Dr. Ken Gentry's great book, Before Jerusalem Fell, uh, if you read Peter Halford's book about the destruction of the temple, if you read Milton Terry's book, Biblical Apocalyptics, if you read the Orthodox Study Bible, if you read St. John Chrysostom's homily on Matthew 24, uh, if you read St. Irenaeus on the uh, passing of the Old Testament in the new and I think book four of against heresies uh, you read Eusebius you read the epistle of Barnabas you read again on and on and on I can keep going uh, this is not a thing that was invented by Jesuits total nonsense total conspiracy theory gobbledygook these are first second third fourth fifth century church fathers that describe this there's a lot more they are adamant that the replacement of the temple with the church is the sign right that that the messianic era is here again all these prophecies are being fulfilled <laughs> as through the years 100 200 300 400 500 600 700 800 900 up to, to today every year Right, more and more people, the farthest ends of the earth, convert and believe in this Messiah. They convert, they understand that it is the God of Israel that is the true God. That is the prediction of all of these prophets. And Daniel stands out as one of the most phenomenal, again. Uh, for a few reasons. For one, he gives a <clears throat> very vast philosophy of history, as we will see. He describes successive world empires under different figures and images. And he amazingly des describes not just the, uh, the, the coming 
and the death and the timing of the Messiah, but also his ascension. And this mystery, none of the other prophets had understood. And I'm not saying that Daniel fully understood it, you know, at the time that he was receiving this message from Gabriel, as he says, but that Daniel was uh, given much more revelation in that regard, uh, you know, being highly favored than uh, many of the other prophets and wise men long to see, as Jesus says. I think uh, in terms of Old Testament prophets, uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Moses, David, Abraham, uh, they really stand out as and maybe you could argue Solomon, maybe. They all stand out as uh, having been shown tremendous amounts <laughs> uh, uh, of what would come, right? And so, in other words, all of them preach the gospel in a very powerful way ahead of time. And as we said, again, specifically, especially uh, Isaiah, especially uh Daniel and especially David in the Psalms, right? I mean, so many of David's Psalms are just straight up all about Christ and his crucifixion and resurrection, right? Tons and tons and tons of Messianic Psalms. Again, all fulfilled in the original Advent, first Advent of Christ. And that's the crucial thing to see here is to understand the, the immediate fulfillment in the first Advent. And I would add to uh, this isn't really the, the right place to get into the, the apocalypse just because of the depth of the symbolism and imagery and difficulty there. Because really to understand the apocalypse and eventually, I mean, I, I would like to, to get to those texts. On, I think that, um, you know, God willing, since I have, you know, put a lot of years into it, I think that it's, it is doable. Uh, that doesn't mean that I would ever dare to say I have all these mysteries solved. Uh, but I think if you have put a lot of years into difficult texts like Ezekiel, uh, Daniel, Zechariah, and then you do get a decent grasp of what's going on in uh, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Luke 17, all that discourse, then it starts to make sense. Uh, and there's plenty of great commentaries uh, like David Chilton's Days of Vengeance from a kind of Anglican perspective that is spot on. It really gets almost all of it correct. Um, but what I will say, even though we, we won't go too deep into that right now, and the Orthodox Study Bible notes, by the way, are pretty pretty great. They're pretty phenomenal. Uh, I read the entire Apocalypse section and notes, and they're all really good. So that 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 gets it correct. And by the, part of the reason why the Orthodox perspective gets a lot of this correct, and the other traditions don't, is because of insights from the liturgy. That's a very important thing. It's very crucial, uh, and. Roman Catholic liturgy, for example, has gone through many revolutions, especially in the 20th century, that make their understanding of things from the liturgy muddled. Uh, I will say, to be, to be fair, I have, for example, an old missal for the Tridentine, the tr traditional Roman rite, uh, and the Tridentine Liturgy Missal actually gets it correct uh, on the things I'm telling you. It gets it correct on the basis of liturgy in the traditional Roman liturgy that the Apocalypse is describing the destruction of the Temple. Matthew 24 is describing the destruction of the Temple. Luke 21. Again, that's not to say that there's not a future fulfillment, obviously, of you know the last things of... Uh, what characterizes the end times, right? Uh, to whatever degree there is a uh, apostasy, to whatever degree there is uh, a possible future antichrist, uh, 
I do believe there is a future conversion of the Jews predicted in Romans 11, uh, et cetera, et cetera. To whatever degree the, those things do await fulfillment, obviously the res resurrection of the body and you know the final judgment, and all that, uh, new heavens, new earth. <laughs> you know, obviously that's a, a future thing. Uh, but but many of the other things are essentially described in prophetic language as fulfilled in the first century and particularly 70 AD so in other words I'm a I believe that that the beast is Nero uh, in the apocalypse now again that's that's a, another whole thing there's a lot of uh, debate and discussion that goes into that but um, one thing I'll say for example about the apocalypse is that again who is uh, John writing to he's not writing to Hal Lindsey's church he's not writing to Paul Crouch at TBN he's writing to the seven churches of Asia Minor in his day and what does he begin the book talking about the things that are shortly to come to pass so right away it's immediately described and explained that John is describing events that are going to come upon the people that he's talking to quickly in his day and so in other words the message has is useless if everything described in it is describing events in the year you know 2017 or whatever it's it's just as useless as Jesus descriptions in Matthew 24 being about you know Palestine in the year 2017 or whatever it has no relevance to the people he's actually talking to at the time but if it's about 70 AD well then it all makes perfect sense it's absolutely useful to his immediate on audience and context right if it's about 70 AD, then the destruction of the temple by Titus fulfills all of these predictions of the another abomination of desolation in the temple. Right? Of course. That's the point of Maccabees. Again, more than one abomination of desolation. Why is Jesus quoting Daniel and Maccabees? Because... Jesus is saying that there's a coming 70 AD abomination of desolation and that's exactly what Titus did Titus defiled the temple with idolatry and pagan insignias right as Josephus describes in the same way as these previous tyrants Antiochus who was the Greek tyrant defiled the temple by sacrificing a pig on on the altar right? pig was considered symbolically for uh, that time period an unclean animal right and I'm saying that the unclean animals were symbolic is what I'm trying to say uh, for a, that's how we understand it in our New Testament period I'm not saying that that uh, they weren't that it didn't matter if you sacrificed a pig on the altar. And it did matter because it was, the intention of the action was to, to defile. And uh, there's some great stories in Maccabees. You read what happens to these people that <laughs> defile the temple, right? Uh, in the same way, when we read the abomination of desolation text in Matthew 24, we understand that Jesus is again describing events that his immediate audience will see and experience, right? Not everybody, necessarily, uh, but some of them. And that's what John describes in his apocalypse. The apocalypse describes curses being poured out, judgments, bold judgments, curses, etc., that are mirrors of the judgments that God swore would happen to Israel in Deuteronomy, right, when he gave the covenant. He says, if you disobey, then the curses will come upon you. So the curses not only come upon flesh Israel, so to speak, uh, in that first century for the 
for the rejection of Christ. Uh, but there is the fulfillment of Hosea's divorce of Israel. So the text of the apocalypse is the divorce of flesh Israel. The covenantal curses are poured out upon flesh Israel. And the new Israel, right, which is the same Israel as Moses, the same Israel as Abraham, same Israel as Noah, same Israel as David, right, the one true Israel, now passes into the apostles. The apostles are the foundations of the new Jerusalem, which is the church. That's why the apocalypse describes foundation stones of the new Jerusalem having the names of the 12 apostles. Because they founded the church, the foundation stones, right? the apostles. Paul describes it as a building built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus says to his disciples, you will sit with me on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what has happened? Well, Paul explains it very clearly in Romans 11. He says that because the Jews rejected their Messiah, the temple was destroyed and they were banished. And he says that to this day, the veil lies on the heart of the Jews and they don't understand when Moses is read that it's describing Christ right and he says that God's able to remove that and he says you being Gentile have been grafted into this tree the church is this tree the church is the vine the church is the sheepfold the church is the ark right and you're grafted in as someone who Right. Paul is using the language of, of Judaism. He's saying that you you who are a Gentile have been grafted into this. Now, does that mean that you uh, have become a practitioner of Judaism? Well, you've been a, you're a practitioner of the true Judaism, which is what uh, Abraham and what Moses and what David believed, right? Not that you can keep these uh, you know, all these crazy commands and that that's what makes you righteous, right? But Christ actually makes you righteous because he can give you literal life and Im immortality. Uh, these commandments written on stone can't impart to you immortality, but Christ can impart to you immortality and thus give you the life by which those commandments can be kept. So what I'm saying is that, that the, the predictions of what would happen uh, at the time of this transition period from the fulfillment of the types and symbols of the Mosaic dispensation, that culmination is at the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That's what I'm saying. And so what happens is that we don't have necessarily, it depends on what you mean by new Israel. In a sense, you could say it's a new Israel because it's now uh, Jew and Gentile together, as Paul says in one church and I'm saying that Jew there who believes in Christ right Paul's writing in his day at a time period when there were Jews who were believers in the Messiah but were still unclear about the keeping of all of these ceremonial commands of the law and so in other words by the time of the council in Acts 15 the Jerusalem council and by the time of uh, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, all of that has been ironed out. So we don't need to, like some evangelicals do, try to figure out if, uh, you know, these, we got to blow a shofar and try to keep all these, uh, you know, Jewish feast days. <laughs> the feast days are the feast days that we have in the Orthodox Church, right? So that's why, uh, you, you know, what is an Orthodox Church? It's a synagogue with icons. If you've ever been inside of a synagogue, you've seen the structure, the layout to the building, the architecture. Uh, it looks like an Orthodox church without icons. So the early churches, again, many of which were synagogues that were converted into churches, the early churches uh, eventually kind of adopted the imagery of the synagogue 
uh, and to a degree aspects of the temple so basically the church is just a continuation of what had already been set up right as quote the true Israel so long story short the Orthodox Church is, is the true Israel uh, and all of that is proven by the apocalyptic text that I'm talking about uh, but again we're not going to get into Revelation we're not going to get into Matthew 24 and Luke 21 what we're going to get into here is Daniel uh, and so this first half of course is for public uh, and to be fair to the subscribers to Jay's analysis the rest of this talk will be for them and so if you uh, want to hear you know what I'm not just going to repeat what I wrote in the essay I'm going to you know uh, get into more depth here uh, with the book of Daniel and uh, how the book of Daniel has very very much aided me over the years uh, and, it, and it works very well with philosophy and as I, as I said philosophy of history because it it uh, just struck me over the years as having such a unique presentation of history I can't think of any other the only thing that I can think of that's close is Spengler's decline of the West because Spengler in a weird way he sees civilizations similar to the way Daniel sees civilizations and empires rising and falling um, that's not to say that I think Spengler is correct uh, no I'm saying that you have two philosophies of history Spengler maybe being the the best possible secular philosophy of history that you could have uh, but still falls completely short precisely because it's not revelation <laughs> right uh, Daniel gets it right Spengler gets it wrong uh, for all of Spengler's insights um, so we'll get into some of that in the, the, the second hour uh, but uh, you can subscribe to Jay's analysis and uh, please spread these links of course I'm censored on social media platforms like uh, Facebook this is now the fourth month of censors being censored um, and you know I presume that will continue so you can help me by sharing the links to Facebook since I can't do that uh, thank you Merry Christmas and in this second part we will get into the book of Daniel